Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand over to our first speaker of the morning, uh, Stephanie, when you're ready. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to speak at this event because I certainly believe that dialogues like these are crucial to building a sustainable future for the entire African continent. So as was mentioned, I'm Stephanie Nalzewa Shando. I'm one of the co-founders of Sustainability Tribe established last year, which is purely a nonprofit movement of youth that's dedicated to enhancing ocean and environmental sustainability literacy. Um, um, on the other side of my life, I am also the Associate Director of the Gulf of Guinea Maritime Institute, which is an NGO um, dedicated to enhancing ocean governance and maritime security um, in, in West Africa and beyond, across the Gulf of Guinea and beyond. So let's just get to it. For me, this presentation is more than just introducing um, sustainability tribe and what we stand for. It's a clarion call for, for youth to play an active role in safeguarding our blue planet. Um, okay, so now sustainability tribe was founded with one goal in mind, and that is to create a growing movement of youth dedicated to a sustainable future for all. I must admit that our pathway um, to achieving this has been highly ocean biased because we recognize not only how vast the ocean space is, but also how central it is to supporting livelihoods on the African continent in particular. So what we hope to do is really threefold. First, to engender a love and, and passion for the ocean amongst African youth. And then second, to create a, a holistic understanding, right, of the unique set of challenges that the ocean faces. And then the third and um, sometimes the most important step or thing that we are looking at is to empower masses of African youth to take action. Our modus operandi is to um, disseminate broad-based knowledge through as many outlets as possible. And I'll get to this in a bit when I talk about what we've done so far. But what is important to ask though is to move past the point of simply enhancing um, ocean literacy or talking about climate change to garnering action amongst the many young individuals who are across the African continent by spreading a message of hope and a message of empowerment. Now, if there, there was anything that was clear during the United Nations Climate Change Conference of Parties in November last year, it was the fact that the ocean is central to addressing the problem of climate change. However, what we know is that state commitments to strengthen ocean resilience and to attain the goals of SDG 14, that's life below water, are, are so insufficient in many ways. So for African states, the consequences of this inaction are much worse because Africa remains the most vulnerable um, continent to climate change. And yet the climate crisis in itself has such dire implications for our ocean health and resilience. And that's the very ocean that so many African livelihoods depend on. The, the, the continent is in, in, in indirectly caught up in a loop, right? A loop of deepening concerns when it comes to the ocean climate nexus. And right there at the center of this loop are African youth. Now, why am I saying this? It's because Africa has the highest percentage of youth than any other continent. And it's the very young ones that stand to inherit the challenges and the burdens that the future presents. So what this means is that youth necessarily have to be at the fore of addressing the continent's environmental challenges. We have the numbers and we certainly hold the unique qualities that make us more prone to driving innovation and change and to addressing wicked problems such as climate change. Of course, this is not to undermine 
the, the, the wealth of experience that the older generation bring on board. But it's just to highlight the fact that we have a, a very unique role to play, right? Because we are definitely within the African context, for instance, key to expanding um, ocean and climate action. But why is our focus on ordinary? Why do I keep talking about the ordinary you? Well, several times what holds individuals back from taking ocean action is just the, the complexity of threats that plague the ocean space. It's easy to feel overwhelmed when we look at the major challenges to ocean sustainability. And it's so easy to feel like there's nothing we can do as you. Okay, it's easy to think that we do not have the capability as ordinary individuals to effect meaningful change or, or to feel as though climate action is for unique, extraordinary individuals, scientists maybe, so that it's easier to do nothing and hope that the, the smart ones sort of figure it out. And there the really are masses of those of us who are seemingly ordinary youth. I'm, I'm one of them. I remember feeling very passionate about the ocean when I started to learn about it. And then moving from that to a feeling of hopelessness. I had the misconception that given that I was no ocean scientist or, or marine bi biologist, that there was little I could do to contribute. And that's the challenge because while scientific and analytical research on the ocean is crucial, when we begin to um, limit ocean sustainability concerns to one discipline. Um, it creates major perceptual inhibitions to progress on Africa's ocean action. So the emphasis is this, that regardless of our backgrounds, of our interests, of our expertise, that all individuals can play a, a meaningful role um, towards addressing the ocean's challenges. And that is the central message of hope that we are hoping to spread even today. Now, all we've taken so far have been baby steps, really. But they are definitely baby steps that we hope will have a snowball effect and that we firmly believe um, will allow us to prove our point that anyone can choose the path of taking meaningful ocean and climate action. So here's the thing. The only source of um, funding we had since we were founded is our willpower. We had a vision to spread a message of passion and action surrounding the ocean for a long time. But, you know, we failed to kickstart this because we, we, we didn't have the resources or the capability to um, take the first steps, like building a website. And so when we started to reframe our thinking and we started to perceptualize things differently, to see that the, the, the entire point is about taking baby steps. Then we took a moment to think, how can we disseminate all the information that we would typically have on a website, right? And that is how our docu website was born. Now, the docu website is a web-based document complete with hyperlinks that allows the user to navigate different pages just as they would a website. The difference though is that this document can actually be downloaded onto your device so that you're able to view all the content at your convenience and learn from the rich information we have there. So that was our first step to try to get information out there. We set up this docu website and then we shared the links with us as many individuals as possible. And then we disseminated it across our social media pages just to give people the, the, a, a clear sense of exactly how the ocean comes to play when we start to look at the major sustainability concerns that the continent faces. And we also um, went on to produce some mini lectures which we disseminated across our social media platforms to create a broad-based understanding of the ocean, of its importance, of the challenges it faces, and then of what youth can do to address these challenges. So um, you'll notice that we have some bullet points there. We, we, we had some simple flyers that we would disseminate on social media, short stories that would intrigue the public and just garner some interest about the ocean. And of course, some blog posts as well. 
But one of the key community-based things that we started to do was to deliver free presentation, um, presentations on ocean literacy for schools. Um, it was very hard, I have to admit, to get a number of schools on board because in as much as we were offering to um, speak to the students for free, we, we kept facing roadblocks where the schools would indicate that they didn't have any time that they could schedule for us to deliver the presentation. So that was a bit of a challenge. It was hard to try to get the school authority to understand the importance of the message that we ultimately wanted to share and to bring them on board. But we were successful in some instances and it was quite a delight being able to speak to um, several young individuals, to tell them about the ocean, to get a sense of their curiosity when we started to speak about the ocean challenges, especially about issues like plastic pollution. Now, beyond the ocean literacy presentations for schools, which is just one of the avenues we've been trying to work through, we've, we've been trying to engage with schools on an ongoing basis. And we've done this by speaking at a number of webinars and events. Um, we, for instance, spoke at um, a webinar by the Institute for Security Studies to highlight the crucial role that African youth have to play in advancing a sustainable and a thriving youth economy for the continent. And we also had an opportunity to share some insights at the UN ECOSOC Youth Forum, again, on the role of youth in addressing some of these major challenges to, to attaining SDG 14 on life below water. And we've tried some academic um, points to, for instance, to, uh, to speaking at the, the fourth Tramarin Conference on Climate Action Beyond States. Again, um, you know, the conference was um, highly academic, right? And most of the time in, in these academic conferences, where we have uh, uh, more experienced individuals sharing insights and, and knowledge. And what we wanted to do was to bring youth to the table, right? So the presentation that we delivered centered on youth and on, you know, on garnering youth, massive youth participation in climate action. And in September, we are also chairing a technical session um, at the seventh International Marine Debris Conference in South Korea. The technical session is also centered on the youth and we are co-chairing it with other colleagues from beyond sustainability tribes. So that has been exciting, just partnering and collaborating with other individuals on this. But essentially, um, the, the session is about how to um, gain momentum amongst youth to drive innovation and change um, towards addressing the, the problem of marine litter. And then finally, we've ha had a few articles, um, but in, in the formal sense, in terms of a formal publication, what we have out there is right back to the deep blue, which was um, published in, in Shackleton Research Trust um, Journal. All right, so that's just, a brief about sustainability tribe, who we are, what we hope to do, what we've done so far. And I look forward to the discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, it makes a lot of sense what you said about all of us having a role to play and it can be quite intimidating trying to find your way into the space and, and finding what you can do. Um, I forget whose quote it is, but I know there's a quote that um, says, we don't need one person doing things perfectly. We need a lot of people doing things imperfectly to, to definitely make a difference. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I'm gonna hold off on questions until after um, our next presentation, if that's all right. Uh, so Mugisa, when, when you're ready, um, Mugisa is joining us from Uganda. Mugisa, when you're ready, you can go ahead. Hello, you all get me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Hello, well, thank you. Thank you, Tara. Uh, uh, Mugisa Paul is my name. Uh, I'm joining from Uganda. Uh, I work with People and Nature Initiative. Uh, it's a, a youth-led organization uh, with African continent. Uh, uh, at the same time, 
uh, are most our students <laughs> promoting a social economic transformation in the local communities of the African states. And also, uh, we normally work with the youth and other vulnerable groups of people that are prone to climate change, uh, migration, and plastic pollution, and including biodiversity loss, anything concerned with environmental matters. Uh, also, I'm a student at Kampala International University. Uh, I'm pursuing my second bachelor's degree in environmental science, technology, and management. Yeah, uh, for now, that, that's my bio. So uh, about environment, uh, 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 plastic pollution, and climate change, uh, we do a uh, work in schools. Uh, we work with young people in schools uh, through a program called uh, Hope Leadership and Innovation Program. Uh, we train young people uh, about climate education, uh, environmental conservation, and management skills. And uh, we also uh, were in partnership with the government of Uganda and other policymakers that we are looking forward to ensure that climate education is integrated in, uh, in the national curriculum uh, of the country, because we hear our curriculum uh, where climate education is not integrated in the curriculum. So we thought of it that we could uh, uh, get in touch with the government officials and then with the policymakers so that we can integrate uh, climate education into the national curriculum so that we can be able to teach the young people about the environment at earlier stages uh, of their growth so that uh, they get to know how should we conserve the environment, what should we do to protect the environment. And so uh, we are really working so hard uh, we also cut out tree, uh, tree planting campaigns in schools and also in the local communities where our aim this year, uh, we, we, our aim is uh, 2.5 million trees before this year ends. Yeah, so uh, that's what we are doing on climate and also we work with refugee camps. Uh, uh, we teach the refugee people a sustainable means of living since these are people who have been uh, other climate refugees uh, and others are our refugees, but currently we are working uh, with climate refugees. Uh, we are trying to integrate our structures so that we can introduce them to uh, our alternatives that are in the environment that can enable them have a sustainable life. Uh, we take an example of uh, uh, deforestation. Here in Uganda, most of the, uh, the highest source of biomass is firewood. Uh, we, we, the very few, like, I think like 0.00%, uh, 0 0.00, like 5% that use biomass. And then our environment here is being so much affected. So we, uh, we, we, we are doing community sensitizations uh, together with the hand of the government so that we can look for sustainable means of living so that people can shift from means that could be more harm to the environment and shift to alternatives that still they can exploit or live from the environment, but also maintain the environment. Okay, that's what we we are working with End Plastic Pollution now. It's an organization in Uganda here that that is aiming at uh, ending plastic pollution, uh, most especially in 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 rivers and lakes in Uganda. We realize that currently in Uganda, that's show that uh, uh, the number of fish that is being caught. Side, like a lot of cavera and other materials that are made out of nylon. So there is a campaign that's going on uh, and uh, of late we are trying to shoot Coca-Cola company. <laughs> yeah, we are trying, we, are, we, we, we have signed a litigation against Coca-Cola company on, 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 on dumping it uh, uh, in River Nile and like Victoria. So we hope uh, the litigation goes well and they're held accountable. Uh, for the pollution bait. And also there is a river that we have, uh, it's called River Rizzi. It's in, in the western part of the country. It has been totally barren by plastic. And 95% of the plastic is from the Coca-Cola company. So most of these polluters are multinational companies that are coming to Uganda. They're aiming at exploiting the environment without putting in consideration of other life that is being supported by that kind of particular environment. So we are doing a lot of sensitization within the country, within the communities, uh, together with the lawmakers, though we're having a challenge. Uh, 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 we don't have finance. Most of our finances are from uh, uh, overseas and they don't come in time most of the time. 
they don't come in time. So once the finances are, are not there, they make our work very ineffective. We don't deliver in time, and then we don't uh, perform activities uh, as per the implementation plan. But we are really working hard uh, to see that the environment is so much protected, and so that we can have the good of it. Uh, I think I can get back to you, Tara. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mugisa. Um, you, you seem to cut out a little bit at the end there, um, but we're going to move on now um, to to our our panelist um, for for today. Um, we're joined by uh, Sibulela Mandela um, as our established um, panelist today to to provide some comments on on the two presentations and um, any feedback or or any um, suggestions going forward. Um, so Sia, um, over to you when you're ready. Hello, Tara. Hi, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Tara, for uh, bringing us uh, and providing this uh, critical platform. And, um, and thank you to my fellow uh, speakers, Stephanie and uh, Mungisa for such a wonderful and excellent uh, presentations. And you will forgive me, I sympathize and I relate very well uh, with, uh, with my dear brother Mugisa's uh, Paul's uh, predicament in so far as the internet is concerned. I'm also speaking at the moment uh, from uh, Kampala, Uganda, and my internet also is, is in that stable at the moment. So uh, please, uh, please bear with me. Um, Stephanie and uh, Mungisa, I think they raise quite uh, critical issues as it pertains to the environment uh, and the climate uh, change challenges that are confronting uh, the world. And, and what is of critical importance uh, to me is the, what Stephanie uh, and what uh, Mungisa uh, emphasized um, on the fact that while climate change and the environmental destruction is a collective and probably a global problem. We have not caused it all collectively. Um, we, it, it's, it, it is a collective, these are collective problems um, and it is indeed a global problem, but it's not something that we have all caused collectively. I was reading a piece more recently, which uh, as um, Stephanie and Mungisa were uh, stating, um, it actually uh, provoked some of the sentiments that were shared by a dear friend of mine, Dr. Salva Heleta, who was writing a piece on climate destruction, environmental destruction, and climate justice. He was arguing else in, in that particular piece that uh, citing this, uh, the intergovernmental panel on climate change that the United States at 23% has contributed the most to climate destruction since 1850. And that is also followed, of course, by Europe uh, at 16%, East Asia uh, at 2%, Africa at 7%, and the Middle East uh, at 2%. And what was also apparent there, which is something that both Mungisa, I think, um, and Stephanie uh, were also citing when looking at environmental destruction um, and climate change and the consequences it has for the global south is that the least developed countries and uh, small islands have contributed probably 0 0.5 and 0, 0 0.4 and 0 4.5 respectively to climate change and environmental destruction and yet they will continue to pay the highest price. And the reason for that particular issue is that climate destruction is in a way, uh, and environmental uh, climate destruction and environmental destruction is in a way a form of structural violence. It is, the, it is oppressive in nature and of course it is exploitation. As, as my colleagues um, and my fellow young folks was, were, were speaking, it prompted to me the, the, the argument that indeed the global north in its quest, of course, for global hegemony, power and control has destroyed the climate and the environment. And they've put the rest of the world on the brink of climate disaster. If you look at some of uh, the issues that Stephanie and Mungisa were citing, which are speaking to some of the challenges that are confronting us and some of the challenges that are had 
uh, it's, it's, it reminds me of the fact that uh, since 2020, disasters such as floods, storms, drought, and wildfires have disrupted the lives of more than 130 million people and have forced more than 30 million people to flee their homes. And of course, if you look as well uh, to, to, to back and substantiate some of the argument that Stephanie was pointing into, the World Bank estimates that by 2050, climate change will displace more than 216 people. And if you have observed uh, in what has been happening in the rest of the world, at the receiving end of some of the uh, challenges of climate change and challenges of environmental destruction, the global south is paying the highest price. If you zoom in into the African continent and you observe some of the disasters such as floods uh, and the drought and wildfires and even famine that has been happening in the African continent, it's something that's happening at the highest scale. Uh, Mungisa um, is, is in Uganda and he can articulate even best uh, there's one of the most, probably the worst famines in the African continent is what is currently happening in the Karamoja region of Uganda. People are dying like flies and people are really having, they're actually eating cow hides. That's how problematic uh, the famine is. That's how climate change, that's how the environmental destruction has contributed to some of the worst challenges that are faced, particularly in the African continent. I, I wouldn't even want to uh, even speak further and substantiate Stephanie and substantiate uh, uh, Mungisa's argument on climate destruction and climate change and this impact in the African continent. If you zoom in even closer to South Africa, uh, where Sustainable Seas Trust is, is based. We recently had one of the worst floods in KZN province. Um, and we even have one of the most problematic famine, probably closer into famine. We are now experiencing a, 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 some sort of a drought in the Eastern uh, region of South Africa, particularly in Port Elizabeth, where we are closer to day zero in so far as access to water is concerned. So these are some of the challenges that are affecting the most vulnerable people in our communities. And if you look at um, the dis internal displaced people across different parts of the African continent, one of the contributing factors to that is uh, environmental destruction and climate change, which largely hasn't been caused by the global South or even the African continent. It's been caused largely by the global North that has contributed vastly into the challenges that the global south, the most vulnerable uh, countries uh, and developing countries, which is mostly in the African continent, Latin America and Asia to a certain degree are now paying the highest of the prices. So for me, as Stephanie and as uh, Mungisa uh, were speaking, particularly Mungisa citing the need to, to sue some of the multilateral organizations such as Coca-Cola for their contribution in climate, in climate change and environmental destruction. It speaks into the argument and the need for what many uh, sees as uh, climate justice, the need for reparations for the injustices that these multilateral and global organizations have caused to most uh, countries in the global south, particularly developing countries within the African continent and the Latin America. And for me, as Stephanie was speaking, in order for that climate justice and environmental justice to take place, this youth have a central role to take in driving that particular agenda. It is becoming clear and apparent to me that the leaders, particularly in the African continent, have no interest whatsoever in driving an agenda for climate justice and environmental justice. And it is only us, the young people, who need to take charge and be at the center of that global debate on climate justice and uh, uh, environmental justice. And it is us as young people whose future is threatened if we do not take charge of that particular agenda. If, uh, if uh, my dear bride Amungisa, for instance, can speak of uh, the Karamoja region that is currently uh, 
engulfed in a state of the worst, probably the worst uh, famines in the African continent. One thing that is going to be a very sharp contrast, if, Mo, if Mungisa can uh, uh, expand on that, is the fact that while the people are suffering so much and dying and flies in that particular region of, uh, of Uganda, that region is one of the most richest regions in the country. Most of the key uh, mineral resources are found in that particular region. And yet the people are dying like flies and yet even governments, both in Uganda and even in the continent, they are continuing their exploitative and extractive exploitation and taking as much resources in that particular region while the people of that region are dying. And that is unfortunately the case for most of the African countries that are, are, are suffering the consequences of environmental uh, destruction and climate uh, destruction. So the youth then has to take a center stage, have to be at the forefront of driving that agenda. And I truly agree um, with Stephanie and I truly agree with Mungisa that we ought to not only uh, be at the center of that uh, discussion, but such has to form part and parcel of our curriculums in the schools to make sure that our young people are educated on environmental, the impacts of environmental destruction and our people are educated on the impact of climate change to the environment today and to the future generations. And what once the young people are well vested in knowledge in so far as the impact of environmental destruction on the world as we live in it today and its impact in the future for the generations yet to come, then we are able to mobilize our young people to, collect, to, to take collective efforts that seeks to rewrite the wrongs of environmental just uh, uh, destruction and climate uh, destruction. So I, I fully agree with them and I am of the view that perhaps we need to begin by finding ways to build bridges between young people from across different parts of the African continent, to engage in dialogues that seeks to design strategies and tactics on how we can all as young people in the continent and as young people in the world take collective efforts as we seek to bring about climate justice, environmental justice, and create a much better world for this generation and generations yet to come. It is of critical importance, uh, Tara and uh, Anga, that I commend the efforts of Sustainable Seas Trust to create such an inter-regional discussion, to create such a platform that is of critical importance to engage young people in dialogue about the issues that affect us today and the issues that are going to affect us in generations yet to come. So we must applaud such effort by Sustainable Seas Trust. And I hope such platforms such as these will continue to engage each much broader, the youth from the African continent in different regions so that we can all have a united agenda as young people on how best to move forward in addressing the challenges of climate destruction and in addressing the challenges of uh, environmental destruction. So thank you very much for now. Those are some of the comments that I'll share and I'll probably respond further on the questions, the Q&A session that will follow. Thank you very much, Tara, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sia, for, for the comments and the insight that you shared there. Um, your, every, all our attendees are welcome to send through any questions or comments that they have to either the Q&A box or to our chats. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you again, Sia. Um, I think that's I'm speaking on behalf of Anga here, but I do believe that's why the African Youth Waste Network expanded their, their reach to include climate change as well and the significant impact that 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 has on, on Africa as a continent, um, on vulnerable communities, and also to recognize the role that plastic plays in, in climate change and, and the emissions that are associated with that. Um, we're gonna circle around to some questions now. And again, you're welcome to, to post any questions that you have in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, for now, uh, Stephanie, you 
you referred to the seventh international marine debris conference um, that's coming up in in korea will you be um, taking part in that are you involved um, in some way presenting perhaps yeah, so we are we are chairing an entire technical session um which is centered on youth youth as drivers of innovation and change so um on on the seven imdc website for instance if you just um, search the technical sessions for TS 4.2. That will be our, our track. Um, there will be a number of speakers from across the globe delivering presentations under this technical session. And we will also deliver a presentation on garnering massive um, youth participation towards addressing the, the problem of plastic pollution. That's that's really incredible congratulations um that's a that's an incredible <laughs> incredible feat to be involved in and it's a it's an incredibly global platform to be a part of so congratulations uh is there is there a way that um youth are able to to track your your progress and the the goings on at the conference and um, perhaps on your social media or, or will there be any particular blogs that you'll be updating while you're there Yes, we'll definitely try and um, provide regular updates on our social media pages. We are um, on LinkedIn as Sustainability Tribe. We are on Twitter as um, at Tribe underscore Sustain. Um, and, you know, throughout the course of the conference, of course, the conference is also going to be aired virtually. So we are hoping that we'll be able to reach as many youth as possible. If, if there are young individuals out there who are at least intrigued by the issue of plastic pollution and how it's affecting the ocean and you know what we can do as young individuals to address those issues, then I'd advise them to tune in. Um, it's being held in September from 18th to 23rd. So even if you are not able to be in attendance in person or be in Busan or South Korea at the time of the conference, we, you know, there's, there's the upside to this new era that we are in. You can always participate virtually and try to tap as much as you can from, from the rich information that will be disseminated throughout the, the event. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's it's very exciting and um, yeah, I'm, I'm very eager to hear what, what comes from the conference and, and what insights are shared there. Um, and I'm very, very glad that you'll be there representing the youth. <laughs> um, can you comment at all? You mentioned in your presentation that you had some challenges um, working with um, schools and the kind of struggles around the curriculum and things like that. Can you provide any suggestions on people who may have similar struggles, how you were able to um, to work with schools and how you were able to share your the presentations that you were making available? Yes, and I think um, that there's a lot of work in there in the sense that you know, different schools have different priorities. And um, in our part of the country, most of the time, the focus is solely on the academics and ensuring that the students get the good grades and so on and so forth. So sometimes, especially when the authorities do not see the, the importance of the, the message that you do intend to pass on to the students, they can be um, roadblock in themselves to you achieving your goals, right? So I think one of the most important things to do is to deliver the presentation to the authorities themselves, you know, to whoever it is who's making the ultimate decision about whether or not you get to speak to the student. So we have a, a presentation that we tailor for, for the school authorities so that we can just give them an insight to why this is a critical issue to begin with and why it's important to get their students involved. And most often than not, it's highly um, crucial to center this um, dialogue with the authorities on, you know, the, the emerging global trends, right? And the fact that education is now moving towards, you know, different angles. It's not just about getting the typical book knowledge, but we are moving towards um, an era where we each need to work um, to building sustainable, uh, a sustainable planet for all. So it's important to get that understanding grounded, right? And in, in order to do that, you need to let them uh, get a sense of the importance of it to them, 
in the in the first place. So that's what we try to do. We try to center the message to each individual school, right? First and foremost, we look at um, their focal areas. What are the co curricular activities that they have that they are particularly interested in? What do they claim to be their mission, their vision, their values? And then we hammer on those things that if it is your mission to indeed, for instance, give holistic education, give a holistic learning experience to your students, then this is certainly one of the areas that you need to be looking at. And once we are able to effectively um, market or sell the ideas to the ultimate decision makers, then we are able to get that opportunity to interact with the students. So I think that's one pathway that can help. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Mugisa, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that your internet connection is uh, letting you bear with us. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, sort of in her work with the schools, um, can you comment at all on your, you refer to the trying to address the curriculum in Uganda in order to, to spread um, environmental awareness. Can you comment at all about um, any struggles you had there and how you were able to, to surmount those struggles? I'm not sure if perhaps you mentioned it earlier, but the, the internet connection was a little bit um, glitchy. <laughs> um, Mugisa, can you hear us? Uh, please, uh, if there are, thank you, so I didn't get uh, clearly the question that you posed. Uh, so, um, Mugisa, I'm glad you can hear us. Yes, uh, I get you now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure, Mugisa, if, if you're able to hear us. We, we can't hear you. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to go now to um, Sia, uh, if you wouldn't mind just um, maybe elaborating a little bit on how, how important leadership qualities are in tackling environmental challenges today. Um, we're, obviously, the series is focusing on, on youth-driven organizations and the work that the youth is doing for, for the environment. Um, so can you comment at all about um, the importance that leadership plays in that role? Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tara. Um, I, I am of the view that um, much of the problems uh, that we are confronting in the world and in the, particularly in the continent as a whole, they relate to the, uh, the consequences of the type and the kind of leaders that we are currently having in the continent. Because oftentimes at the center and at the forefront of the response to the challenges that we face, be it the issues of uh, environmental destruction, climate destruction, and other related injustices that are, of, that are very prevalent in the African continent, they relate directly into the kind of leaders that we have. And for me, when we have young people occupying positions of leadership, where they are part and parcel of the decision making, where they are part and parcel or they are in the table where decisions are, are being taken. We are going to be able to directly respond to issues that not only affect young people in the African continent, but also that affect our communities in general. So for me, we need the kind of leaders, particularly young leaders that are more concerned about contemporary issues that also have creative ideas to respond to issues that are affecting us in contemporary times. But if we have, as it is so apparent, Tara, and as it is so apparent, Stephanie and uh, Mungisa, if we have the kind of a leadership structure where young people are excluded in the decision-making processes, we are going to continue to discuss possible solutions to the problems that affect our environment on the sidelines while the people who are making uh, the decisions, while the people who are making policies that respond to such problems are in the decision-making table. Then we are going to have a disjuncture in terms of how we respond to the, pro to the problems that affect this generation and the communities that we live in. So for me, we ought to press forward as young people to be included 
in the decision-making processes. If you look across the structures of government in the African continent, young people are underrepresented and yet the majority, what makes the majority of the population of the African continent is largely young people. It's made of the youth, but we're not involved in those decision-making processes. So when we see at the moment, the rise of youth-led organizations, civil society organizations, NPOs, it gives us hope to say change, the winds of change are finally blowing in the African continent. But it needs not to end there. As young people, we need to begin then contesting the spaces, even political spaces, so that we can be able to effect the changes that we discuss on the sidelines in the different environmental organizations that we work with. So we not, need not to only engage uh, institutions from civil society organizations, but also we must contest spaces of power so that we send in, in the decision-making tables those young people who are conscious about the, the responses and the minded of young people in the African continent. And also, lastly, Tara, I would like to also add uh, a suggestion to Stephanie's uh, argument and to uh, Mungisa's argument, particularly as it pertaining to uh, introducing in the education curriculum uh, some of uh, the environmental uh, responsive kind of education, environmental education and climate change education. I will also suggest to them that they must also include the media in that process of engagement. Because when the media, which is one of the cornerstone of any development and any democracy in the country is not also included, and particularly if one of the core functions of the media is to inform the communities and to drive the public debate, if we miss an opportunity to also engage them, we're then also missing an opportunity to broadly engage the communities on the issues that are affecting them. So I would say, Stephanie, not only, do not only engage, uh, have an intervention on the education curriculum, but also take notice of the importance of the media in, in that particular process. You know, create bridges between the media, engage them so that they provide you with space so you can talk about such issues on different uh, mediums of media, be it in radio, television, in uh, print uh, media, so that you write about these issues, so that you talk about these issues, so that you make these issues part and parcel of the public debate in the countries that we engaged in. So those are some of my suggestions that I would give to, to both Mungisa and uh, to, to you, Stephanie. And if you need assistance, we are connected with uh, a lot of media houses uh, across different parts of the African continent. In Ghana, we have a project that we work with different media organizations there on issues around uh, human rights, climate change as well. So if you need assistance, and if you have pieces that you need to be published, I have a, a, a reservoir of journalists that we are that are working under our project and different media houses that can be of great assistance to you, uh, Stephanie, and uh, to you, Mungisa. I was with over 25 journalists just yesterday in a training here in Kampala. So if you need uh, assistance in link to create linkages between you and those media houses, also reach out as well so that this kind of message, this kind of knowledge is also forming part and parcel of the global debate. Uh, and it is at the center of uh, the national debates in the countries where your organizations are operating. And thank you, Tara. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sia, and thank you for, for the comments and, and for the offer um, for, for Sefi and Mugisa. I'm sure that would be very helpful. I see we're getting very close to our, our cutoff time, um, and I think Mugisa has had a bit of internet connectivity issues. Um, so we're going to close the final question for, for Stephanie and Mugisa if he's able to rejoin us. Um, Stephanie, what would you say is your dream for the African continent towards the fight against plastic pollution and climate change? I'd, I'd simply say that my dream is to to be, be able to dwell in an era where we witness massive youth participation um, in tackling these issues, where we begin to see um, youth at the fore of driving innovation and change in addressing these problems.
problems because I strongly believe that the youth hold the answer. And to be able to um, be in an era where, where such um, action is witnessed would be phenomenal. Okay, thank you so much, Stephanie. And um, if anyone does have any questions at a later stage, you're welcome to email us and we can pass those along to, to today's speakers. Um, so you're welcome to email us at webinars at secafrica.org.za. Um, for now, I think we can close off today's session. We do have a, a final session in our series, which is taking place on Thursday this week. So if you haven't already registered, um, please, please we encourage you to do so and to join us for the final session in the series. Uh, you can find the link to register on the SST events page. And we just like to say as a closing, um, thank you so much for joining us today and a particular thank you to our speakers for, for taking the time to join us today, even with the, the struggles with, challenging, with traveling and the challenges with internet. Uh, we really appreciate the time as well as the work that you're doing for the environment and your work against pollution and climate change. So thank you so much. Thank you too for having us. Thank right. you Tara and thank you Aranga. Thank you, everyone, on behalf of uh, Anga from the SST's African Youth Waste Network and myself and SST as a whole. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.